Hi, welcome to the 2022 Scheme Update. First of all, a really big thank you to all of you that have been delivering training over the last 12 months. It's been another difficult year and whilst we did get a little bit closer to normal, there was still a lot of disruption and uncertainty about what was going on in the world. Let's hope 2022 sees us getting even more closely back to normal. Well, now that I'm in a nice comfy room and out of the wind, we can have a little bit of a chat. And during this presentation, if you've got any questions, please use the Q&A section, which is just to the right hand side of your screen, hopefully, uh, where you can type in your questions and we've got a bank of people ready to answer your questions as, as we go through the presentation. So in the last year, there's been quite a lot of staff changes within the RYA. Uh, in fact, in the Training and Publications Department, there are 14 roles now that have got either new or temporary staff in them. Uh, that's almost 50% of, of the whole team. Uh, so we've got a lot of onboarding to do. But within there, there are two roles that are quite important to me, and that is the e-learning manager. Uh, we have a new e-learning manager. Amy Frampton has taken over from Jane Hall, who's, who's left the RWA at the back end of last year. And there's also Victoria Jacobs is the new as of next week, shore-based manager, looking after the shore-based schemes. And so I'm quite excited with these new people, new ideas. Let's see what we can get done in the next year or so. Within the shore-based scheme, one of the big focuses for this year is reviewing our Days Give Me Up Master Courses to try to embed e-navigation uh, more thoroughly through the course. So it's not just something that is tagged on the end, which is what it has been historically. One of the reasons for doing that is the MCA uh, completed their STCW review and issued a report last year about how their STCW training um, fits the modern seafarers' requirements. And amongst their recommendations was quite a strong recommendation to balance off the time between teaching paper traditional techniques and um, the electronic techniques, making it more 50-50. And that's what we're looking to do is try to embed the use of electronic navigation equipment in the planning and execution of passages. And that's really a, a big focus for next year. I put up a QR code here so you could actually download the STCW uh, review. Uh, it's a relatively interesting read for those that are interested in this stuff. And I'll also put the link in the chat for those that are watching it live at the moment. Another report, and again, I'll put up a QR code now for that, is from the MAIB and the Dutch MAIB, which is a review of basically ECDIS and its role in incidents and accidents uh, in recent years. And an interesting conclusion that they've come to is that after 20 years of being in existence and being compulsory training is it's only just in the implementation phase, which is quite interesting. I mean, it means that we're in good company trying to work out how best to train people. And a big factor from uh, the MEIB's report is that we've got to remember that the humans are still in charge and they need to be on top of and in control of the equipment they're using as opposed to being uh, reactive to what it's telling you to do. You're in charge of the boat, you're skippering the boat, not the electronic equipment. And that's certainly a theme that we will carry through in our review. Obviously, an elephant in the room is that the electronic charts that we have on our small boats are not approved and the systems that display them are also not approved. But it's been quite an interesting year for progress there. There was a new committee set up or a group set up, a working group called the Pleasure Vessel Navigations um, Working Group. And that's chaired by Paul Bryan from the Royal Institute of Navigation. And it was set up by the MCA with, with Rin leading it. Um, to look at a set of requirements or standards that would enable electronic charts to be approved for use on non-solar vessels, on small craft, but also the, the uh, corresponding equipment that will be displaying it, whether it be a, a plotter or an MFD setup. It's involved the UKHO, the MCA, the leading electronic chart manufacturers, creators, and the manufacturers of plotters, and it's been pretty positive, and there's there's hope and quite a lot of hope that actually we will end up with equipment that can be used which will make our job as instructors easier when we've got a defined set of criteria and standards or functionality 
and it also means that we can genuinely say you can navigate with this electronic equipment on board. Paul Bryan's actually recorded a short presentation, a half hour presentation, which is available in the conference about the work of that committee or that work group and where it's got to and who's been involved. So I really recommend you go search that out in the on-demand videos and have a, have a listen to what he's got to say. It's actually quite exciting at the moment. And the final part from me is that just a reminder that if you're talking about EPIRBs and PLBs and registering them, there is now an online system for that from the on the gov.uk website and again here's a QR code for you to get into that and I'll also put the link into the chat. Okay I'm going to hand over to Steen now who's going to give us the ins and outs of what's going on in the crazy world of publications. Thank you very much. Over to Steen. Hi my name's Steen Ingerslev and this will be a little update on our way of publications. I don't want to dwell too much on COVID, but I will cover a little ground so that I can contextualise some of the changes and initiatives we'll be putting in place this year. Our normally robust supply chain has been severely impacted over the last two years, and some of you will have seen this uh, in the availability of stock of powerboat packs and other key items. There have been delays to shipping where we've imported goods and component parts, customs delays, container availability issues, port blockages, export customs issues, particularly when shipping to the EU, it's been relentless. The impact this has had on availability of the resources you need to deliver the courses has been really highlighted this year. So we are taking appropriate action to address this for the future and prioritising course material. We've taken the decision to move the printing of key packs to the UK that aren't already in the UK to reduce the impact that COVID, Brexit, Suez Canal blockages or whatever else can cause delays to our supply chain. These measures also dovetail nicely into our sustainability approach by moving course packs to the UK over the next couple of years and then starting also to look at retail books. It will seriously reduce our carbon footprint from the upstream transport element of the process. This is just the first part of what we'll be looking at in our approach before we look at paper, coating and other elements. Our approach is one of sensitivity to significant cost change. There is no question that all these changes could have a really positive impact from a sustainability point of view, but each one comes at a cost. All this is in addition to the already massive rise in material costs over the last two years. For example, paper prices have seen a 66% increase over the course of 2021 alone. We will be doing all we can to either neutralise increases or absorb what is reasonable, but I'm afraid it's inevitable that some prices will have to go up over the next couple of years, and some more than they ordinarily would. This last year, the team has seen a noticeable increase in requests for accessible content, but one thing that is apparent when dealing with these requests is that the scale of what we can do is still not very widely known. So this little piece serves as a reminder of our accessible books and the service we offer. There is a brilliant example which showcases the collaboration between RWA instructors and the RWA eBooks team, supporting blind boater David Kelly last year, who was determined not to let his disability define him. It's featured in the RWA magazine recently, but if you haven't had the chance to read it, then you can find a link to the article on our audiobooks page. The key thing I want to get across is that we already have 33 super accessible eBooks conforming to the WCAG 2.0 AA standard, and more are coming all the time. These have adjustable text size, font, and background color, and we make them compatible with screen reader software, voiceover, and text-to-speech, and there are also text descriptions for images and captions for videos. We've also made certain design adjustments for the presentation of our text, numbers, boxes, tables, borders, layout, images, and symbols to all help support our accessible approach moving forward. While this is just for the retail books, we offer a custom service to deal with accessible versions of course material. So the key message is that if you're an instructor looking for support of one of your student, students with any kind of visual or reading impairment, such as being partially sighted, fully blind, dyslexic or reading with a switch device, then please get in touch with the team or go to the accessible books page on our website. There is more we can do to support you and your students than you might think. We've listened to feedback from training centres who've not been very happy with the 10% charge in order to redeem the OA vouchers. 
So we found another way to fund the scheme and as of the 1st of January this year there will no longer be any fee when you redeem your voucher. To put it in clearer terms you will receive 100% of the value of the voucher so there really isn't any obstacle for a centre to accept an OE voucher unless of course you don't want the customer's business. This is another area where we've listened to feedback from instructors and retail customers uh, and made a few changes to our e-subscriptions. Firstly, we've added the RWA introduction to Radar to the Power and Yachtmaster subscriptions as this is an important area for those two particular schemes. We've also added our four training charts to the Power Scheme instructor-only content for the purpose of being able to demonstrate elementary chart concepts, features and symbols for the navigation parts to that scheme. We've got several new additions out recently for the dinghy scheme that you'll be pleased to see. The new RWA National Sailing Scheme Instructor Handbook, G14, the new National Sailing Scheme Syllabus and Logbook, G4, and the Youth Sailing Scheme Syllabus and Logbook, G11. There is also a new edition of the Personal Watercraft Handbook, G35, in its final stages, and of course more new editions underway for release during this year. We are expanding our audiobook range and have added Start Sailing and Advanced Sailing to the list already with two more in the recording studio. The audiobook of the National Sailing Scheme Instructor Handbook and Collision Regulations will be coming very soon. You can listen to the tasters from our audiobooks page on our website or go to our stand and click on the link. Now one interesting development in audiobooks is the improvement in auto narration. I'm not talking about the robotic voices that might come to mind, I'm talking about realistic but synthetic narration and we'll be looking to test that this year to help escalate our audiobooks program. We are welcoming volunteers to test this and give feedback, so if you are interested in joining a test group for this then please drop us a line uh, in the team in books. Now, Looking forward, there will be an online trade shop upgrade which we will aim to deliver by the end of the year. It will enable trade customers to have more self-sufficiency by paying for invoices online, take advantage of unique online-only promotions, gift ebooks to customers or instructors, and take advantage of further digitised e-packs, as well as a whole load of other features. Now, the only thing left to mention and let's face it, the main thing you've been waiting for with this is the special conference discount. So please just visit the publication stand where you find numerous ways to access the discount code. The team are manning the stand for the whole day, so if you've got any other questions, then please just stop by. Hi, I'm Amy Frampton and I'm the e-learning manager here at the RYA after taking over from Jane Hall in November last year. I previously worked alongside Jane for just over five years as the e-learning assistant, during which time I supported the day-to-day -day running of the interactive site and also rebuilt the essential navigation course whilst working from home during the COVID lockdown. As some of you may be aware, we upgraded the interactive site at the end of November 2021, so my plan for the first few months in my role is to iron out those few crinkles, getting the site both working and looking at its best. For the rest of the year, my aim is to then review and refresh our existing courses, keeping them both relevant and up to date with the current day. In recent years, pre-learning has been created to assist the existing instructor training, something I wish to progress with in the future, as half of short based learning is now being done online. Many of you might have actually experienced the interactive site yourself, whether that's be pre-course learning, instructor prep or revalidations, and we want to create more of these courses in the future. Hi, what a beautiful day. This is where I love to be with my family. Although today it feels like I'm stealing a day with the sun shining, the children are at school, and I'm here with my husband and we've just had lunch in cows. I'm Victoria Jacobs and I've been working for many years at the RYA in various roles. And on Monday, I start the role of shore base manager. And I'm really excited and I hope to meet many of you and work with some of you over the coming years. It's going to be fun. Anyway, I better get on because it's too, too nice out here. Bye for now. Thanks Vicky and congratulations on the new role. So I'm Vaughan Marsh, I'm the Chief Instructor for Sail and Motor Cruising. I'm going to talk to you 
for around the next seven minutes on cruising schemes. Firstly, Yachtmaster Instructor Courses and the Yachtmaster Instructor and Cruising Instructor Revalidations. That's uh, all of which need to be booked online. As part of the booking, you'll be sent uh, a little while later a link to the pre-learning, uh, which takes around four hours. It's got some videos that look a little bit like well, this here that you're looking at now. Uh, and also um, there's quite a few various teachings and assessments type things just to help you get your head into preparing for either the course or the revalidation. There's also uh, you select a theory subject from one of eight uh, and then when you come along you can deliver that. It gives you a bit of time to think about all of that and turn up hopefully with uh, a reasonably good lesson and well prepared for either the revalidation or the course. When we looked at the course over the last couple of years, we've just reduced the Yachtmaster Instructor sale course from five days down to four days. Uh, that's partly cost saving. It's cheaper for you if you don't have to charter a boat uh, an instructor for another day, but also with us adding in the pre-learning um, and not using the high line anymore, it just created a bit more space for us. So it seems we didn't want to just waste your time. Uh, and hopefully that works. So we'll run that this year and see how that goes. Everything else is back to normal. So if you lived on a boat before, then you're living on the boat, uh, fed on the boat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The only thing is, in some cases, there are some instructors that still can't travel outside the UK or outside of the Gibraltar area or um, Australia or New Zealand, where we are running revalidations. And in some cases, you may not be able to get to a reval. Uh, so we put it on again revalidations for this year. They're online. They only give you two years from when you were due to run out. Um, but at least it gives you an opportunity and by then hopefully you should be able to travel again. Next is Yachtmaster Instructor Sale um, and Power Courses. So the Yachtmaster Instructor Course and route to it. So if you're an existing Yachtmaster Instructor in one discipline or you're not and you want to become a Yachtmaster Instructor, what's the route? In both cases it's very very much the same, which is you need to be a Yachtmaster and then you would do a Cruising Instructor Course and then you do a Yachtmaster Instructor Course. So let's say you were a Yachtmaster instructor sale and you wanted to go to motor, you would still need to do a Yachtmaster exam followed by a cruising instructor course followed by a Yachtmaster instructor course. There is exceptions in everything in life. And if you have got a really good amount of experience in, let's say you're going for that motor Yachtmaster instructor, uh, then I'd have a look at it. So please, if you do feel that you are, are capable of missing out cruising instructor because it, you have a good depth of experience within a motor cruiser, uh, then by all means, uh, drop me a CV, drop me an email with your CV and I'll have a look at it. And I'll have a look at your previous Yachtmaster instructor reports and uh, and just make a decision from that. And I'll probably pick the phone up and talk to you. We're having a look at whether we need to reconsider or consider um, what vessels should be in the motor cruising scheme. Uh, so these are identical vessels from uh, Sea Line. Uh, however, one's got two petrol things hanging off the back and one's got two diesel thing, things hanging underneath the floor. Because of that, the motor cruiser at the moment is the diesel engine and the petrol engine is not within the motor cruising scheme. And I think it's fair that we have a look at that and just see, should it fit? Uh, if it should fit, where should it fit? And um, how far into the motor cruising scheme should something with petrol outboards become uh, and so we're just having a look at that please don't email me next week saying you want to do your yacht master prep on an axle par 28 because i'll say well we're not ready for that yet and we may never be but but at least be aware that we're working on it reasonably short on this uh icc paperwork has changed so throw away your old icc forms uh, and then use the new ones uh, as of uh 31st of march 2021 yeah, certification department where we were rejecting any ICC applications on the old form. And that's about the data that needs to be captured on it and some of the data that didn't need to be captured on it. So making sure that it's fit for purpose or, or somebody can apply online. I hope that you never have any accidents or incidents. However, if you do, you do need to report them to us. Uh, and that's not so that we can tell you off. It really is so that we can learn from it and share it with other people if we need to so that the accidents and incidents never happen again. Uh, so there is a form. It is an online form. It doesn't take long at all, uh, but it, it is something that's a requirement as part of your responsibilities as a school. So please do use it. 
Talking of which, uh, an Australian uh, instructor sent her this because it was sent on the it was uh, posted on the AMSA website. Although it was an Australian, it's wrong. It was a, a United States flagged vessel, and it was an accident there. Uh, they just thought it was worth us sharing, and I and I agree. So this was a 22.8 meter United States flagged passenger vessel. It says passenger vessel. It was more a dive vessel, really, um, a residential. 39 people on board, of which when the fire took place, 34 of them perished, which is just awful. Quite a lot came out of it in learning. Uh, and, and, and I just thought, well, we really need to just think about this. So this was a fire that was in the saloon area, they believe, started in the saloon area. Uh, and um, they believe it was probably started by the quantity of uh, things that were on charge. So dive computers, cameras, phones, laptops, etc., etc., all on charge in the saloon area. And there was no smoke detector in the saloon area because it was all in the cabins. Uh, and they had an anchor watch, but the anchor watch didn't go down below and have a look to see whether there was any fires. They, they were looking for vessels coming towards them rather than looking for incidents inside the boat. So it made us think, well, you need to actually have a think about that. So have a look at your risk assessments, have a look at your um, safety management system. Consider if you are someone that's in the cabin or your people are in the cabin, how would they get out? If there was a fire in the saloon, think about where your smoke detection and, and fire detection systems are. And then consider your electrical system or whether the quantity of batteries that are being charged, because we've all got 53 things we need to charge every night. Is that capable of charging that? Do you need to rethink either whether they can charge them at all or how that's done uh, to keep people safe. Last bit really for me is uh, Yacht Master um, exams, areas to work on. So people should have a good understanding of radar and that we've been carrying that for a fair few years on the conference. Uh, that blind nav, when you're thinking about teaching blind nav or learning blind nav, that then I don't believe that blind nav is about, um, there's gonna be a fold bank in five minutes. So maybe you should think about taking a plot and then go down below, here's a broken pencil or a pen knife. And here's a bit of a chart, how we go and see you can get on, how you get on. It really is about they should be going down below because it's the easiest place where they won't see all the navigational aids by looking just left or right around the boat. But then they can use all the kit that's there so they can use the radar and they can use the plotters and they can use the depth, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you see them just looking at one particular thing and not using the others, then that's when you think about, well, I'll probably need to take that away from you so that you can use the other stuff. But so they get to use all those bits and pieces. Have a good understanding of the engine. So hands on, knowing where bits and pieces are, knowing full systems and then a good understanding of stability and buoyancy, uh, understanding things like free surface effect and down flooding and, and why you would have your hatches in when you were going downwind uh, in, uh, and, and, or in a big sea, etc. Uh, and then also a good understanding of boat handling and being able to do it uh, and being in command of the vessel when they are the skipper. That's it from me. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, hope to see you in person uh, throughout this year and hope to see you in person at the conference next year. Uh, and I'm handing over to Rachel Andrews. Thanks Vaughan. Hi. I'm Rachel Andrews, I'm the Chief Instructor for the Power Schemes of Powerboat, Personal Watercraft and Inland Waterways and I've got a little bit of an eclectic mix of uh, updates for you today. Let's go! We've had a really good news story on the accessibility front. We've had our very first student come through on a Powerboat Level 2 course and successfully pass it who is registered blind. Now that took a little bit of prep beforehand and I spoke with the instructor, gave them some advice and put them in contact with somebody who would have a little bit more specialist knowledge. We're also able to alter the Start Powerboating book, uh, the e-version, to make sure that it was as accessible as possible, which is something that we are able to do if we're given enough time. So if you do have somebody who uh, perhaps has a little bit more uh, challenges taking the power boating courses or any of our courses please get in contact because there's lots of advice that we've got and people we can put you in contact with as well as being able to look at our publications from their point of view. When we're teaching beginners power boating something that's really important is that the instructor is able to maintain the safe operation of the boat the whole time so it's really important that the instructor is in a position to be able to reach both the throttle and the kill cord at all times so take a look at any of the training vessels that you're using and make sure that the instructor is positioned in an unobstructed position so they can get right to those controls i must admit 
at the odd time that I have had to stop the boat in an emergency or to alter its course, it's not the kill quad I've been after. It's always been the throttles. I've needed to get the boat to slow down or speed up or do something. Um, so just being able to pull the kill cord isn't really good enough. When we're looking at teaching people who have already got those basic skills, things like on the safety boat course or further up, it's not as imperative that the instructor is sat in that position. It's just for those beginner courses, powerboat level one and two. So make sure you take a look at those training vessels and decide where's the instructor position on your vessels. Just a little reminder, if your training centre is using marine radios for their communication, then anybody using them needs to hold the short range certificate. The SRC certificate can be taken online or in person, and both of which will also have an in-person assessment. It's a good bit of continued professional development, so if you don't already have it, why not treat yourself this year? On the personal watercraft front, we've got some exciting news. Got a brand new uh, personal watercraft handbook coming out, which has been rewritten by Candy Abbott, and it includes lots of updates to do with things like move forward in technology and other bits and bobs to do with more advanced riding, so the kind of things that people might be getting up to after they finish one of our courses. In other news, we are changing the requirement for what personal buoyancy people need to wear on courses. They're going to need to wear a, a buoyancy impact vest, so that will mean that it's, they've got more protection lower down on the torso, so that if they do end up impacting with the uh, handlebars, then they've got a better protection. Other things that take up my time on, on personal watercraft is working on accessibility, so making sure that people are able to access the water. And something that we can do as instructors to really help with that is to reiterate on courses where to find out about bylaws and uh, launching information, launch fees and that sort of thing, to make sure that people are able to access the water responsibly and uh, keep themselves out of, uh, out of trouble. As we know, over the last couple of years, there's been plenty of push to get ourselves out and about and into nature. Getting next to or on the water as well has been a top priority. And the inland waterways are absolutely no exception to this. I hope that our training centres have managed to bring lots of new faces in and get them out and about training and getting really used to this lovely area of waterways. Something I'd really like our training centres to think about is I'd like them to check their mobile phone signal just to make sure that should there be an incident and we really hope there isn't that you're able to get the emergency services to you as soon as possible what I'd like you to do is to take a long, take a, a look along your operating area at the mobile phone signal itself and mark out any areas where you've got blank spots if you have got blank spots what you need to do is think about the contingency how are you going to make contact with the emergency services should the need arise. One thing you could do is to get hold of a satellite phone where you've got text communication with emergency services and that will work anywhere and especially is useful in rural areas where that signal can be very poor. If you've got any questions about this please do give us a call in the training department and I'd be happy to have a little chat with you about it. We can't help but notice the amount of electric vehicles that are out about on the roads now with the electric charge points all over the place and neighbours picking them up. I'm certainly thinking about electric for my next vehicle. But what about for the marine industry? We certainly are seeing the small outboard engines for tenders selling like hotcakes. So I think it is coming. If this is something you're interested in for your club or training centre, then there's a session on this talking about electric power within the training centre environment, which you can watch either on demand or next. If you deliver in multiple power schemes, you might want to consider the ebook subscription, which has got 20 different titles in it, including now the RWA radar handbook, which is useful for getting our advanced power instructors up to scratch on that topic. And also in the instructor only section, there is the logbook, and also some of the charts, three, four, five, and six are included. So that's really helpful if you're trying to introduce people to charts on a powerboat level two at a center inland. And now for something a little different. Check this out. The RWA is looking at trialing e-foiling this year. That is electric surfboards. We're seeing them popping up around the coastline and we'd like to be able to help our centers to train people and to make sure they're being used in the most safe way so that everybody 
can keep having fun on the water. Watch this space for more information as it comes up. And finally, it's all changed in the power scheme side of things. I say thank you very much and goodbye to Chloe Evans, who's been the power schemes administrator as she moves on to become the training department senior administrator. And welcome and hello to Kerry Pang, who becomes the new power schemes administrator. And last but not least, I'd like to say a big thank you to you as the trainers, instructors, and principles within the power schemes. Without you, we'd have no scheme. Thank you so much for your dedication, and I hope 22 works out to be a great year for you. Now I'll hand over to Amanda for her update. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, I'm Amanda Van Senten. I'm the Chief Instructor for the Sailing, Windsurfing and Wing Schemes. And over the next couple of minutes, I'm gonna give you a few updates and also some things to look forward to in 2022. During 2020 and 2021, the RYA made a number of temporary adjustments to course and instructor training delivery during the coronavirus pandemic. One of these elements was the dinghy instructor course, which was changed into a two-part course delivery, while at times we weren't able to sail double-handed boats. At the end of last year, we carried out a survey to further understand people's thoughts on retaining this adapted two-part delivery. We gained some positive support as well as some really thought-provoking feedback, so thank you for everybody who responded to this survey. A further element that's been discussed is a senior instructor course, where a small working party got together to discuss course delivery, content and learning objectives. Outcomes for both of these areas will be shared shortly, both the dinghy instructor course delivery as well as the SI course. In 2021, many of you will know that we piloted an RYA wing scheme and it's been an amazing 12 months. Thank you very much for everybody's support. It's been quite overwhelming the number of people that have been interested, instructors and centres, in delivering these courses and this scheme. As such, I'm really excited to be able to tell you that the RYA have decided to officially launch the RYA wing scheme and have it as an official scheme within the RYA training department for 2022. The launch will take place at the RYA Dinghy and Water Sports Show. So if you're at the show, please come and find us. To be able to deliver the RYA wing scheme, you will need RYA recognition like any other training, like any other training scheme. You'll also be able to gain certificates. It's really important that courses are, um, when courses are completed, certificates are issued because we can tell the popularity of a scheme from these certificate sales. And when a scheme is new, such as the wing scheme, it's really valuable to be able to tell just how popular it is and what courses people are looking to take. So if you do gain recognition, please do issue certificates when people complete courses. There's quite a lot of instructor training opportunity taking place already. So whether you're interested in wing surfing or wing foiling, there should be a course out there from you from March onwards all the way through to October. So please do take a look at the course details on the RWA website or contact RWA Training Direct. Other guidance that is, are available are the instructor training handbooks as well as scheme syllabus both of which are not in hard copies, but available in the RWA ebook app and on the training support site. For now, thank you very much from everyone who's enabled me to get the RWA wing scheme this far. I'd just like to go through a number, safe, uh, number of safety and pre-season training points. We've been looking at keel boats a lot over the last two years. And further investigations have just reinforced how important masthead flotation is and that it's not actually just for dinghies. So please do reevaluate the keelboats that you have within your operating environment and, if necessary, fit masthead flotation. Rescue tex techniques and a guidance document is currently being comp compiled for um, the rescuing of keelboats which have lifting keels. All our evaluation has been done on the RS Venture. We understand that there's quite a few other keelboats out there with lifting keels. So please do take some time to look at staff training and the rescue techniques required for these boats. Safety Assure is an important element. So please do make sure your staff training covers things like dinghy parks and slipways. 
especially caution with demasting ashore and things like that. So do cover this when you do your staff training, whether it's pre-season, during season and at the end of the season. Reminders are always key. In other news, we've got a new, G, new G14, so please do take a look at that. And we've also got some new dinghy courses that have come through from the trainings, uh, come through from the racing department, sorry. So these used to be start, intermediate and advance, and they are now start, club, regional and championship. We do hope that the racing, the racing courses will also bring windsurfing in line shortly. Please do remember to take a look at the latest training notices and guidance. The ones relative to the small boat scheme at the moment are the introduction of the wing scheme, the changes in the racing courses, and also reinforcement for masthead flotation in the national sailing and youth schemes. The RYA training support site has got a number of different elements. One of the key elements within here is the CPD hub. So please do take a look at it. It's forever changing and new content is being incorporated all the time. It can be found in the qualifications tab on the training support site. And then when the drop down box comes on the right hand side, you'll find CPD. Within there are a number of different elements from webinars, videos and articles. If you've got some more information you'd like added, please do let us know. There's a number of ROA events taking place during 2022. Unfortunately, the instructor training days are not able to take place face to face this year and they are um, they will be virtual events. So there's no single regional events for 2022. They're going to take place in the evening every Tuesday night from the 9th of February. Rachel and I will be kicking this off, off with a, um, in a, a, a training update covering our schemes. There's also then an inspectors update on the 9th of March. So please do look out for these elements. Other events to look out for are the OA Sailability Conference. And of course, I've already mentioned it, the OA Dinghy and Water Sports Show, where there, it's an exciting new venue. Unfortunately, we're all, we are also saying a farewell to my wingwoman. Moni Nolans will be moving from OA training in mid-February, but she's not going very far. She's going, she's managed to get a job as the OA events coordinator for racing. Our loss is the racing and technical team's gain. So thank you very much, Molly, for all your hard work and dedication, and we wish you all the luck in the future. For now, thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and have a great day. <laughs>